Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to Emotional Grit, the podcast where you can learn about the power of perspective and the science that fuels us. I'm your host, Jennifer Fernjack, and the YouTube channel for these episodes is actually called Emotional Grit as well. So please feel free to like and subscribe. I am honored to say that today's guest is Erica Parsons. She is a child life specialist at the Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. So we have a lot to talk today about pain perception and how we can actually help patients and then caregivers and the overall hospital as well. So with all that said, Erica, I am so excited to get started with this stuff. Um, Could you please start by explaining what a child life specialist, like what what does that mean for people? What's what's, uh, what does the job entail? Sure. Well, um, Thanks for having me on the podcast. It's a it's an honor, likewise, to be here. Uh, I could talk about child life till I was blue in the face. So I'm so excited um, that we're going to be reaching some more people this way, and some more um, caregivers out there in the world are going to get to know this field and what we can do for children um, in the hospital setting. So child life specialists are typically in a hospital setting. Um, Typically, we're at children's hospitals. There are a few of us at adult facilities as well. Um, But we are focused on the the patient experience. And uh, I've heard people describe us as social workers for the medical side, um, teachers for the hospital. So the basis is that we get calls for patients who have been in the hospital for a long time, who are coming for a specific test or procedure, and we can go in and explain the test or procedure or the hospital stay to a patient in developmentally appropriate language. So we're trying to alter their experience to be developmentally appropriate to um, just increase their perception of what's going on, their understanding of what's going on, and ultimately their cooperation. Um, that's kind of the gist. You, I don't know if you want me to talk about anything more specific, but that's the yeah. overall background. Actually, that, that's perfect. It kind of like lays a foundation for just what you do. And, and uh, we'll get into more of the details, of course, as the uh, the podcast progresses. Great. So the, re- the reason why um, all this even came to my attention as far as what you and your hospital are doing is because, um, as my listeners know, uh, back in 2016, I got the surprising diagnosis of a meningioma brain tumor, uh, size of a golf ball, actually on the left side of my head, outside the brain, uh, between the optic nerve and the carotid artery. So not really an ideal place per se, but mm-hmm. I'm grateful to say that uh, that half of the tumor was removed. The other half got radiation treatments, even though it wasn't uh, cancerous, with the thought of killing the remaining cells. But as you can imagine, throughout that whole process, whether it was the anticipation of the surgery or perhaps um, uh, going through it, and then of course having to try to heal from it and having the corresponding radiation treatments, there was just a lot to not only experience physically, but also the mental, psychological, and emotional aspects of it as well. They all come together at the same time. So I know in preparation for the surgery, my neurosurgeon had asked that I have a number of functional MRIs, which I'd never heard of before. But basically, I would be in the MRI machine each time for over an hour. And the, the actual machine, I, I had an IV of contrast in my arm, which is, which is as you know, like a, it uh, goes through your veins and it went up to my head and created uh, greater uh, clarity for the images that the uh, neurosurgeon was able to see. And by having these images taken, it then let him know what the best angle was to actually get in and, you know, cut through my skull and get into my head and do what he had to do with doing the least amount of damage. But the thing about it is that uh, uh, knowing that all these things had to happen, whether it's getting in the enclosure of the MRI machine for over an hour each time, and the fact that so many people were negative. I mean, whether I talked to family or friends or colleagues or neighbors or whomever, anybody who had had an MRI before that was of that length of time. Uh, we're all just like, you're going to feel buried alive. You're going to feel claustrophobic, oh, even if you're no. not usually. I'm thinking, you're not helping. You know, uh, like, come on, throw me a bone, you know. Yeah. But, um, and then as far as the IVF contrast that was going to go on my arm, you know, I, I've had a history of decades of uh, passing out, whether it's on my dermatologist table, having a mole removed, <laughs> like, shouldn't be a big deal. Um, in my dentist's chair, just anticipating what was coming, I would pass out before even getting the Novocaine. I mean, it's, I've been told it's an overactive vasal vagal response, whatever that is, but it's just, it just kind of is what it is. But I knew that as that related to the, uh, these functional MRIs and then getting that IV in my arm, I thought, you know, I don't want to prolong things. So I knew there were two things I had to try to figure out. One was the potential for claustrophobia. And then the other was for potentially passing out and how I wanted to try to prevent that. So uh, I basically told myself that whenever I would go to the hospital, 
and get into one of the MRI machines, which, you know, started above my head and then went down past my knees. So it's, and I I had like a mask on my face. It was like a hockey mask kind of yeah. that clamp, clamped over it. So I couldn't move my head. I also had a Velcro strap around my arms. So I, I couldn't move in the machine at all. But what I did every time is I laid there with my eyes closed and I pretended that I was back in high school in a tanning booth. And I never <laughs> once felt claustrophobic. <laughs> so I'm I'm grateful to say that even though I'm not trying to promote the idea of tanning booths, you know, we, we know now, you know, that they're not good for you. But back when I was in school, it just meant that you were either going to go to prom or go on vacation. You, know, you wanted kind of that base tan, you know, yeah. but, you know, it's all but, about but the it, guided imagery. So whatever oh, works for, sure, for whatever person, that's what, you know, that's how you do it. So I'm so glad you were able to come up with that. Thank you. And, and it made me realize it's not the presence of the enclosure, in this case, the MRI machine, that's the problem. It's how you perceive it that makes a difference. Because when I pretended that it was a tanning booth, that was more of a sense of control because I, I would have been there by choice. Yeah. You know, it meant that I was doing it in anticipation of doing something fun. So, you know, e even though I was grateful that people had been very transparent with me as far as their own experiences with uh, quote unquote, feeling buried alive and what have you, I, I learned to kind of take those things with a grain of salt because maybe my experience could be different. Regarding the uh, IV of contrast that was put in my arm, I thought, you know, isn't it kind of strange that, again, I've passed out so much over the years, but yet somehow when I was in third grade, I got my ears pierced and didn't pass out, and that's two needles. So again, it made me realize that if I had some kind of a sense of control, in this case, choosing to get my ears pierced, um, or I back then I got my ears pierced because I pass I memorized my times tables. That's how my dad <laughs> said I could get my ears pierced. You know, excellent, but, excellent. But it made me realize maybe it's not the needles that are the problem. Instead, it was how I was perceiving it because I wanted to get my ears pierced. Yeah. You know, I. I also thought about how uh, when I was on spring break a few times when I was in college, there were a number of my friends who are also afraid of needles, but somehow on spring break, they managed to get tattoos and not pass out, mm -hmm. <laughs> but they wanted the tattoos, you know? Um, so with all that uh, being said, whenever I went to the hospital and had to have an idea of, or IV of contrast put in my arm, I would do a couple of different things. Um, I would either pretend that I was at a spa um, getting acupuncture, or I would pretend that I was getting Botox. And I've never done either of those things, but at least if I wanted to, you know, <laughs> that it, I, yeah, I would be, it would be a choice. Definitely. Um, or I would pretend that my four-year-old nephew uh, was at the hospital with me. And I would pretend that the doctor said, okay, Jennifer, either you get the IV of dye in your arm or he does. Oh. And of course I'd say, pick me. Yes. So if I could be strong for a child, why couldn't I be strong for me? Well, it turns out that I could. And in tandem with that, I, I learned later that there's something about altruism where you're doing something nice, or at least you're thinking in this case, like I, I thought I was doing something nice for my nephew. It can actually lower stress hormones and influence serotonin levels, which is a feel good chemical of the brain. So I never once passed out with the, with the needles. So all that being said, I thought, you know, am I kind of a lone wolf with my mindset here? I thought I want to build an awareness about this, some ways people can use how they perceive things to be in their in their as the, like a benefit to them, not a detriment to their experience. So a, a few years ago, I uh, did this virtual meeting through the National Organization of um, Arts and Health. It's called NOAA. And I met a woman there named Krista who told me about your hospital and told me about the things that you do. And so that's why today I want to try to um, let the listeners know what types of things are being done at your hospital, uh, what kinds of things you're doing, not only for little kids, but also for tweens and for uh, young adults as well, um, as far as how they perceive uh, uh, pain and just the potential things like claustrophobia and what have you. So all that being said, and kind of laying that as the foundation, I'm wondering, could you please start by talking about the idea of the um, adventure series or, or the theme rooms, things like that, and how they how they uh, set, or, or like work for people. Sure. So I was trying to take some notes while you're talking because as you were talking, so many ideas were running through my head of stuff that we do every day for our kids here and that child life specialists are doing all around the country that you know people don't know about, but it's the same kind of concept. Um, so one thing uh, really quickly before I forget is this sense of control. It's so important when it comes to a healthcare experience because really nobody is choosing to come to the hospital to have a procedure done or have an overnight stay or surgery or what have you. Um, so 
a lot of my job, the focus is on cooperation um, from a staffing standpoint. So we can see more kids in a day. If kids come in, do what they're supposed to do, and we can move on to the next one. So that's, I get called a lot for cooperation. And the biggest thing that I talk about with my coworkers is providing kids a sense of control. So we do kind of this restructuring of language that you think when you're working with a child, you want to say, are you ready to do X, Y, and Z? And if you respond to that, I mean, even adults, they're in their heads, they're thinking, no, I'm not ready. I don't want to do this. And then all of a sudden it becomes a choice. Well, you asked me if I'm ready. I said no. And so that's the end. But then we're going to force them to do it anyway. So we try and caution our staff to, you know, that's a small thing you can do is just not ask, are you ready for your MRI? It's it's time for your MRI. Do you want to sit up on this table or do you want mom mm-hmm. to put you on the table? Uh, that gives them the appropriate sense of control. So they Makes get sense. to choose how they get onto the MRI table, not about getting the MRI at all. Um so I just wanted to put that little aside in because you're you're right on the money with that sense of control. It makes a huge difference to the way everyone perceives their healthcare experience. Um, but as far as the adventure series, it's something that I'm super proud of about our hospital. And we have done just such a good job growing over the years. So I have been at UPMC Children's Hospital for 11 years in the radiology department. And the adventure series was something new right before I started, where we had a few themed rooms. So our MRI suites are all decorated like outer space. Our CT camera is a pirate ship. Um, Our nuclear medicine cameras are decorated like the jungle. And we had this um, like immersive art kind of focus. So not only are the machines themselves decorated, but the walls are all decorated. The floor is decorated. Um, There's lighting that corresponds like the jungle theme room has this like dark green strobe light going on (laughs) in the room. Um, Everything is you're really immersing yourself in that idea that you're going in the jungle or you're going to a pirate ship. Um, Our CT camera has this monkey on the wall that actually moves. So when you push on it, he swings back and forth. And we have patients look so forward to coming to that room. And after they've done it once, they, every time they come back, they want to see the monkey and they want to swing the monkey. And a neat thing that's come out of that is the screw that attaches the monkey to the wall is not tightened the whole way. And it makes a squeaking sound when you push the monkey. So these kids think that the monkey is talking to them. So we will go in the room, we let them swing the monkey. And then we say, did you hear that? That monkey is reminding you to hold still for your pictures. And we have had little kids have full conversations with this monkey. They say something, they swing it, and you know they will repeat it, whatever the monkey's words back to them. So smart. So smart. It makes a huge difference. They look forward to coming into this room as opposed to being forced to do it. It's the it's the novelty. You know, Mm -hmm. it's the whole novelty. I mean, I I I wrote about that in my book where um there's this restaurant, for example, in Wisconsin, I think it's in Door County, has a roof made of grass and they have goats that eat the grass. So people will drive from, I mean, different states even, or they'll fly there because the novelty, because you, you don't expect to go to a restaurant and see goats eating grass on the roof, but that's what attracts people to it because it's different. You know, it's, it's also why Pike's Pike, or is it called Pike's Place or whatever, that place in Seattle, <laughs> it's, it's like a fish market where people will go there to buy fish and the people who work there uh, will like wrap the fish up and then they'll throw it around. They'll throw it to the guy behind them or the guy ahead of them. And people, oh again, gosh. have made it a, this famous place. Like they'll go there to go check out the novelty of it. So yeah. for you to have that monkey there, you know, for the kids, they're going to remember that. They're going to be excited to go there. And it, yeah. it helps not only soothe them. When you can try to uh, reduce anxiety and, then of course, influence pain perception as well, yes, it helps in that moment, but it also has a kind of a pay it forward effect because now if the patient has to come back later, they're less apt to worry about it ahead of time. They're more apt to think, oh, I want to go back and see the monkey, that kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. so that's brilliant. Another really fantastic thing about these themed rooms is it's influencing the parents' perception of being there and the caregivers. So they, similar to you, have had these experiences as children themselves or even as adults in these very sterile rooms where everyone has given them these horrible renditions of what it felt like for them. They remember it being terrible. They remember it being cold, isolating, scary. um, Sterile. 
Yes, sterile, intense, sad. I mean, all of these negative emotions that go with it. So when they have to bring their child to the hospital, you know, somebody that they love more than anything that they're supposed to be taken care of, they get all of this pent up anxiety, remembering what it was like for them as a kid. And they walk into our themed rooms and you can just see the relaxation coming over these families. They, The parents just inevitably take this big breath. Their shoulders come down. They can relax because it's not that sterile negative environment that they remember. It's a fun, developmentally appropriate, exciting room. And all of a sudden, they are not anxious about bringing their child for this procedure. And they're, you know, when they are less anxious, the child, yeah, their anxiety rubs off on the child. So yes. they everyone in the room is less anxious. So it really, it's become a huge benefit from a caregiver standpoint as well. When you mentioned, uh, was it developmentally appropriate? Was that the term that you used? I did, I, yes. I'm, I'm wondering if that's because, you know, technically one could argue that I'm an adult, uh, but even though I'm an adult as far as age goes, my my historical fear of needles and what have you, one might say, well, it's not it's not tied to an age per se, because I, you don't grow out of it necessarily. It's just more who right? the person is. So I don't know yeah. if that's kind of what that means. So we will say often it's the stage, not the age. Yes. <laughs> so it, it doesn't matter what age you're in. It's whatever stage of life you're in, whatever stage of development you're in, whatever stage of uh, anxiety that you find yourself in. That's where we're going to meet you and how we're going to we're going to help you cope through the experience. But it's these mm -hmm. rooms have made such an impact on the patient, the caregiver, the staff. I haven't even mentioned them. We are constantly being pushed by our staff to decorate more rooms and more hallways um, because they feel more at peace and at comfort with a have more comfortable sense about them walking into these rooms. They feel like they that. have something extra to offer the patient and the family. When they bring them into one of our plain rooms, they feel like, I know I could be doing better. I can't because of my limited resources, but I know it's physically possible that I could be doing one more thing to make this easier for you. Uh, so everybody wants to have one of these themes rooms to bring their own patients into. That's smart. I know that, uh, when you think about hospitals, of course, they have budgets, just like any other business yeah. does, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, I would imagine that having to pay to put decals on the floor and paint murals and decorate machines and all that kind of stuff obviously has a cost. However, if it can help lower turnover of staff because their job is less stressful or, or perhaps reduce sedation rates, because what, from, like, from what I've read about the hospital, sedation rates have been greatly affected by this approach. And so Absolutely. if you're lowering sedation rates, that's going to obviously help whether it's with lower um, uh, as far as like liability of the hospital or different things as well. It's also mm -hmm. going to make a difference to your point, whether it's parents coming in. I mean, if a child is is fussing and, and just crying and won't lay still to the point where they have to be sedated, I mean, that's going to add stress for everybody. And so um, obviously yeah. by soothing the underlying patient and then um, you can actually get through more appointments, I would think as well, because they're going to mm -hmm. be shorter in duration because you're not having to get the person to lay still or what have you. Yeah. Um, so yes, there are costs up front, but the benefits, I mean, it, it's an investment, not just a, really is. a cost. It really know? is. It makes a huge difference. We will also have, um, just like any other hospital, and I work in radiology, so it's an outpatient area where we are constantly delayed. <laughs> Anyone who is watching who has had to go to a radiology appointment, you always, you know, you sit at least 10 minutes longer than they tell you you're going to be sitting in the waiting room um, or in your procedure room. So we uh, have divided or devised all of these I spy sheets for our adventure rooms um, and our themed rooms. So we can give them to patients at the beginning, um, along with a few other things I can talk about, but they get these I spy lists and they it gives them something to do, something to get their mind off of what to expect, something to occupy them while they're waiting. Um, and playing I spy in the room kind of normalizes that environment for them. So it's not so strange and they have less of the fear of the unknown once they're familiar with the room and with the things in it. The machines seem less scary when you're just trying, you've been, you know, you're searching for this ice cream shop and or the goldfish and you've been searching for 10 minutes and you realize oh that's the machine taking my picture it's actually a big goldfish um that's that makes so a, awesome, a big that's difference. So awesome. Yeah. again it's the novelty of it and and if you think about it um as far as like 
I had my my um, tanning booth uh, metaphor for myself, but but for these kids at the hospital, if the if the machine is decorated like a pirate ship or a submarine or whatever it is, the kid can feel more like they're at Six Flags or at Disneyland, you know, getting into a ride as opposed mm-hmm. to an ominous machine at a hospital. I mean, perception is key, and I I think back to um, when I was in high school, there were these kids I would babysit who were deathly afraid of thunderstorms. And so whenever I would be there babysitting, if it was thundering and lightning outside, they're all running around screaming and crying and stuff. So uh, one day I had this brilliant idea. I said, okay, you guys, come sit down on the couch. So they all came and sat down and the the tears are coming down their faces. And I said, do you know what this sound means? Like when you, when you hear that, that loud noise outside and they, of course, you're like, it's thundering. And I said, or, and they were young enough that they thought this was legit. I said, or maybe it's one of the angels birthday parties and yeah. they decided to go bowling. I said, so I think that whenever whenever you hear one of those booms, it means that they hit all the pins with their ball and we should clap for them. So all of a sudden, they yes. like whenever we hear one of the booms, they're all clapping and the tears are gone and they're excited. But it made me realize, even back in high school, again, that whole idea of it's not the stimulus that's the problem. It's how you perceive it that makes a huge difference. So it's just again the whole idea of Six Flags or a Valley or a, a Valley Fair. We have that in Minnesota here, but uh, Disneyland as well as far as uh, perceiving ominous machines as rides, huge yeah. difference. And th- there's a term that psychologists use called cognitive reframing, and that's basically where when you can kind of reframe how you perceive something and kind of flip the script, it makes a huge difference. So so for me, uh, whether it's been at doctor appointments or dental appointments, if I'm feeling some kind of a needle, I'll tell myself that's my cat scratching me. Because if it was one of my cats, I would just think that was cute, you know, and I would yeah. think, oh, they didn't mean it. They're fine, you know, whatever. And I, I would somehow justify it. So, yeah. you know, so you're promoting that whole mindset there as well. But um, do you have any uh, particular stories as far as uh, uh, a certain uh, child or a caregiver, uh, either way, mm-hmm. as far as how this has had an impact on them? Um, I will think as we keep talking, but one yeah. story uh, specifically I wanted to mention because it, I keep thinking about it as you're talking and, you know, speaking of cognitive reframing and your tanning booth story is we use a technique here called guided imagery and a yeah. lot of child life specialists will employ this in different areas. And I have found in my practice that it's the most helpful for that, um, you know, teenage population, the uh, the more mature 12 year old, you know, somebody who's a little old for, they think these walls are, you know, for kids and all all the toys I bring in the room are for kids. So to help them get, you know, you can't forget about that population in there. That's a huge piece of who comes here. Um, So to help them get through a lot of these scans, we use this technique called guided imagery. And so it's really where you bring them into this scene of something they have more control over, something they're more comfortable with. So I also serve radiation oncology and those patients will come every day for anywhere up to six weeks for their treatment. And we, you know, that would be a lot of anesthesia for those kids to get. So we get called a lot to get those kids through their radiation treatments. Um, And some kids who are a little bit older, physically, they can do it. They just don't want to. (laughs) Um, And, you know, you can't blame them. So there's some regulations. They can't have movie goggles on like they can an MRI. They, the parent can't be in the room like they can in CT or MRI. So we've, you know, really relied heavily on this guided imagery technique. So I'm I keep picturing my one patient who was 16 and she had this radiation treatment. She did not want to be there. Um, Shouldn't even really want to talk to anybody there. She wanted nothing to do with it. And she would get her treatments. And this room happens to be a beach themed room. So for this age population, this kind of guided imagery of a beach works really well because they've been to the beach a few times. They can remember what that's like. Um, so she goes into the camera room. I have a little microphone. It goes right to where she is. She can hear me very clearly. And we, she closes her eyes and we just go sense by sense as to now we are officially at the beach. There is, um, I have sounds of waves going on in the background. So we talk about the waves and what are you smell? Like a lot of patients, radiation oncology patients will report a really negative smell, um, especially if we're treating one of those nerves in the head near wherever their tumor is or was. Um, so we'll talk about, we don't smell anything negative in this room. We smell salt water and we smell like, um, different 
I think she was like, we were smelling hot dogs. She (laughs) would kind of like help me guide through this, this process. But what are we smelling? What are we seeing? We're seeing the sun setting and we're seeing people running up and down the beach and you're feeling the sand being kicked up on you as somebody runs by and you, you know, you get down to every specific detail and each sense. And, you know, this, before I know it, I was talking for 20 minutes and she was oftentimes would fall asleep by the end of it um, each day, but every day, you know, we're doing this every day for six weeks. So I was getting really creative with my, <laughs> my beach, knowledge awesome. and my beach metaphors, but that, you know, that sense of re- that um, immersive art of with the walls, like it was already a beach room. So we just really brought her home with that guided imagery and it, it made it more for her versus, you know, the hippo surfing on the wall that the four-year-old it's ta- loves. It's tailored. Yeah. So we really totally. were able to bring it bring it home for her. And now we do, we you know we've got the guided imagery in our toolkits, but um we've got Spotify set up in there now. We've got projectors going on. There's a lot of options for wow. these kids now. But we we always go back to that. With the guided um guided imagery, is that what it was called? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yep. Is that something where it's all things you think about or is it literally like I, I know some hospitals would have like stickers you can put on you where it's aromatherapy. So you can sure. smell the salt water or the beach or whatever. But yeah. If you could get that scent, definitely. We do have those same stickers, um, but we only have it in lavender sandalwood, I think, and oh. orange mint. Um, so we use those a lot for our patients who are nauseous or are so worked up that they're, you know, their stomachs are upset. So we'll get the the orange. But I have found those aromatherapy tabs are fantastic for older patients, but the younger kids have a hard time relating to those specific scents. Um, And we always say, you know, someday we'd love to devise like the chocolate and the peanut butter and (laughs) cotton candy, (laughs) like the real, the little kid smells. But for those older kids, those taps work fantastic. So so basically then it's more a matter of mentally thinking of the, okay, that makes sense. Yeah. It's that cognitive shift, that cognitive reframing. Um, mm-hmm. giving you a sense of control because you would want to be at the beach. You wouldn't want to be in radiation or you would want to be. And then, you know, that beach metaphor is fantastic for those older kids, but the little kids, they don't, they don't remember really the beach. It's really right. hard to get them into it. So we're right. focused more on like a playground guided image. <laughs> yeah, that, that makes sense. Well, and kudos to you and your, and your hospital for acknowledging that what works for some of the smaller kids may, may or may not make sense as kids get older, you know, and just kind of depends on the person and what they're experiencing. But I know that uh, when I went in to that have my stage, radiation. stage, not the age, right? Oh, excuse you me, that's right. right. Whatever get... stage you're in. <laughs> yes, I've, I've got to, I've got to get my vernacular correct. Yes, <laughs> but uh, um, I, I know that when I went in to have my radiation treatments, the first day that I walked in the room, I could see people's radiation masks on the wall, and it looked almost like some kind of a, I don't want to say dungeon, but it, it just seemed kind of ominous, you know, like all, all these masks mm-hmm. everywhere and these machines, yeah. and they're like torture I, I devices, knew that, right? I, I knew that when the, the radiation was going to come in my head, it wouldn't just hit the remaining part of the mass. It's going to hit whatever's in its way. And so I thought initially, I'm like, oh, what, what's this going to be like? And I, I just didn't know what to think. So in the radiation room, uh, my hospital had a, uh, a CD player, uh, which I hadn't seen for a long time. <laughs> but they had a CD <laughs> player in there. And they had CDs uh, for me to choose from, uh, which was super nice. Um, but unfortunately, the the songs that were on the CDs didn't have um, any kind of uh, relevance for, for me and growing up or whatever. It didn't quite connect with with me. Nice music, but not really my my thing. So being the uh, the consummate extrovert that I am, I, I had noticed uh, in the room that there was a docking station. So I asked one of the radiation techs, I said, would you mind if I bring in my smartphone? And that way, when I have these radiation sessions, which were like three minutes a piece, I think, something like that. I said, then I could listen to my music and, and just put my phone in your docking station and I could hear things that remind me of college or high school or, you know, whatever. And um, at the risk of dating myself, um, I like uh, old school hip hop and hair bands. So it's anywhere from like a little bit of Run DMC to ha- or like Def Leppard or, you know, whatever. Yes. So every day when I was there, that's what would take place. There'd, there'd be music like that. Well, I did it in part because I thought when I lay there, I could quiz myself on the lyrics. And so sure enough, it was songs that I was familiar with. So I'd quiz myself on the lyrics. And there was this one day the the song was uh, Rob Bass and DJ Easy Rock. It was like, it takes two from like the late 80s, oh, yeah, early 90s, yeah. whatever. Yeah, a little, I want to rock right now. I'm Rob Bass and I came <laughs> to get down, blah, 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 whatever. Well, I kid you not, 
Um, the song is maybe two thirds of the way over. All of a sudden, the radiation machine turned off because the the test or the, the the treatment was done for the day. But for a split second, I was disappointed. I wanted to finish my song. I literally had forgotten where I was. And with the person I mentioned earlier, named Krista, who I met at the the NOAA conference, um, she had asked me. She said, hey, "Have you ever heard of this term called um, highway hypnosis?" And I was like, "Well, no, I'm not familiar with that." And she said, "It's kind of like." When somebody drives home from work and all of a sudden they get home and they're like, yeah, I have no idea how I just got here <laughs> because maybe they were daydreaming or whatever. Now they still got home safely, but their mind is kind of in a different place and maybe like making a, a, a grocery list or whatever you're thinking about. But that's kind of what happened to me. It's like I honestly forgot where I was. And that's a true testament to being in that setting, but having music that was relevant to me and being able to um, laugh with the radiation techs and things like that. And um, just like what you do as far as those good soft skills and being able to connect with people. But um, I, on one day in particular. control over being there. Exactly. You got to control what you listen to. You couldn't control having to go, but you got yep. to control what you heard. Exactly. And um, on one particular day, the song of the day was uh, Rapper's Delight by the Sugar Hill Gang, which is a super old song, <laughs> but it starts out kind of disco-y, then the guys start rapping over it, whatever. Well, the radiation tech would come over, uh, put the strap on my arms, put the mask on my face. I'm literally laying on a radiation table, if you will, about like the width of a weight bench, you know, so the, so the, so the strap is so my arms won't flail. And the machine's then going to be going over my head once he turns it on. Well, after he got me all situated, he went into the observation room where he would look at a wall full of computers, and then there was going to be a... Um, uh, an observation, like look at look at me through glass and have a microphone to give me directions as needed. Well, before he went in there, he would then turn on, you know, Rapper's Delight by the Sugar Hill Gang. So I'm laying there, ready to go. The music's going, you know. The radiation tech goes into the observation room and unbeknownst to me, grabs the microphone and said, and today we have a little radiation for the ladies. <laughs> it was, it was, I was at some kind of nightclub, not on a radiation table. That's and I'm telling you, the act of kindness, the laughter, the music, those those are all three things that I, that I tell my listeners can lower stress hormones and influence the feel-good chemicals of the brain. So not only did they help me that day, uh, but they helped the caregiver as well. I and mean, I, can, I can't even fathom whether it's your, your role or his, being in a situation day after day with person after person who doesn't want to be there, they could be projecting how they're feeling onto you, that kind of thing, even though it's not your fault or whatever's going on. And so I'm just so grateful that that your hospital as well has a mindset of, hey, you know what? What about the older kids? What about the what about some of the the, the young adults and that kind of thing? And um, I know one suggested suggestion that I had um, for the hospital and for other hospitals um, since then is. Uh, if, they, if they don't have the, the proper equipment to do some of the things that you're talking about, encourage your patient to bring their smartphone. Uh, the hospital could already have a docking station, but perhaps yeah. maybe instead of music, maybe the person wants to listen to a white noise app. You know, lay there and close their eyes and hear waves or hear the sound of crickets. Uh, pretend your MRI machine is a tent and you're camping. Again, it's that flipping the script. It's having a, a sense of control. It's that kind of thing. And I know that um, with, with music, um, last summer I shared uh, the book that I wrote and uh, different things at a neuro-oncology conference in Hamburg, Germany, and I met a neurosurgeon from Denmark, and he approached me and just said that people from his staff had suggested he talk to me about my book, and uh, he said, well, give me an example of something, and, you know, what what is it about your book and why, kind of like, why should I care about what you wrote, you know, and I shared with him what I shared with you, and I said, uh, I asked him, I said, does your hospital um, in Denmark let sh- patients choose music? And he said, well, yeah, they they choose their favorite kind of music. And I said, well, that's great, but it would go even further if they could pick pick their favorite bands or better yet, their favorite songs. And he kind of looked at me like, wasn't that semantics? And I, I said, well, let's let's have a hypothetical. Let's pretend that instead of you being the surgeon, you're now the patient. And uh, the hospital asks, what's your, what's your favorite kind of music? What would you say? And he said, well, I would say classical. And I'm like, all right, not not exactly Def Leppard or Randy MC, but we'll you know we'll let it we'll let it slide. But uh, he goes, I would say classical. And I went, all right. I said, so who's your favorite composer? And he said, well, Tchaikovsky, of course. And I went, all right. I said, who's your least favorite composer? And he said, Mozart. And I said, okay. Now let's go back to the hospital. 
if they if, if they say what's your favorite kind of music and you say classical, what if they play Mozart the whole time? You're going to hate it. And the light bulb just went off in his mind and he realized, wow, you know what? I mean, what you and I are saying right now, a lot of people don't even yeah, know that know. there can be it's it's called salient stimulus when it has meaning for that person uh, can make a big difference in how they experience things. And it's something yeah. so small you can do, and it makes such a large impact. Yeah. So you had mentioned at one point the idea of uh, the glasses, like movie glasses. How how, sure. how do those work, and in, in what context do you offer them? So we have a couple different options uh, when it comes to watching something. So our specifically with the glasses are our MRI cameras. So we have off we now have a set for each MRI camera and they're just actual like movie glasses that go over your eyes and they're MRI safe and they're hooked up to a DVD player and we have like 530 movies um being circulated around the hospital. We also ask patients if they would like to bring in their own movie, they're welcome to do that. Um but having the movie to watch has made a huge difference. I know some hospitals have a like a mirror that they can put in their MRI scanner. So patients are able to see um, like a projection on the wall into the scanner. We have found that the movie goggles have worked even better um, at reducing our sedation rates. Uh, it's a more personal experience. You, the One of my favorite things is you can't see anything. It wraps the whole way around your eyes. So you can't see anything but the movie. So that helmet that you were describing earlier, we will relate it to a, like a football helmet. Um, it doesn't actually touch you. So if they've got that movie on and the sounds are started and they're all tucked in and then we put that helmet on, they don't feel it. They don't see it. They never, most often never know it's there. Um, so Brilliant. it really takes away a huge part of that you know, the scare factor or the negative feelings um, for the MRI. As far That's as our, so brilliant. Yeah, it's it's been a huge game changer for us. I know we've had them since before I started here um, on a couple scanners. Now we have them on every scanner. And then we actually have an MRI simulator. Um, we now have movie goggles in the simulator as well. So we will, we see a lot of this fear of the unknown at this hospital. You know, a lot of these kids have never had an MRI before. And so they're scheduled with sedation and anesthesia solely because we have no idea how they will how they will handle it, um, which most kids end up handling it really super well, especially if they get to watch a movie. So we will take them into the simulator. We simulate the whole thing. They ride in. It looks and feels exactly like a scanner. It makes the sounds. It plays the movie. And nine times out of 10, they're able to do it. So we've reduced our sedation by 50 percent by using this this uh, simulator and these movie goggles. That is um, so, I keep saying brilliant, but it's just, it's it's just so brilliant. It's like, it's like, I want to go to wh whoever the decision makers are at the hospital, whether it's your board or whomever and be like, thank you. Yes, they, <laughs> because, it's been so impactful. And honestly, right. philanthropy has made it all possible. Most of all of these resources that we have, and I'll talk to you a little bit about our video options for our other modalities, but most of these resources we have have all been funded by families who have come through and want to give back or by other big donors, you know, in the Pittsburgh area um, or anyone who's been affected by our hospital. So we have, you know, our whole simulator, the movie goggles was all donated by one family. Um, so I, anyone who, you know, feels inclined or is touched by this video, please reach out to your local children's hospital because they are looking for resources like this and it makes a big difference. Oh, yeah, um, for sure. But our, as far as the, we have a lot of iPads circulating in our department, which we have found the most useful, not just because for the reasons we've already described where you are taking them kind of out of this, you know, negative environment and immersing them into something more fun and gives them more control, but it's really helpful for positioning. So we will use it even on, you know, very young children just for a simple x-ray. You think, an x-ray sounds quick. You know, it takes two seconds. We just need you to, you know, turn your head completely to the side while keeping your shoulders forward. And for a little kid, that it sounds easy, but it's really hard to do. And so oftentimes they're being strapped to a table with their head being strapped down this way, their shoulders strapped down this way. All And now we've created this trauma. And this now anytime that they need an x-ray, it's going to be a huge ordeal because they remember being restrained. Um, so now we're using these iPads and we put on depending on the age, whatever it is they choose. Um, and we position the iPad over here. We have a parent maybe 
holding their shoulders straight. But if, as I move the iPad and a parent holds the shoulders, they're turning willingly. And in that time that they turned over, we snapped the picture, it's over. They never had to lay down. They never had to be restrained. And they remember it that they got to go to the hospital and watch Coco Melon or Louie or whatever it was. They don't remember, you know, instead of I went to the hospital and they strapped me down. And I mean, it just makes such a difference. Same thing with the IVs. We will use the iPads or the light spinner wands, especially for little babies. Um, you know, they they have their arm held out. They're about to get the poke. I turn on the stimulus over here on the side. By the time they're focused on what it is, the poke is done. And their brain was so focused on trying to figure out what I was doing over here that they didn't feel this in the same way. Oftentimes they don't feel it at all. Um, so it's just really been a game changer with those resources we use like the iPad, the movie goggles, the light spinners. Um, it's really helped in many different ways. Wow. So I know that um, my my uh, my old dentist um, invented these virtual reality glasses for people to use. So sure. when you're sitting in the dental chair, you can put on the virtual reality glasses and you could choose like a scuba scene where it looks like you yourself are going through the water. And so it's just, yeah. it's interesting how virtual reality is now becoming more popular as well in different settings. Mm-hmm. It's, it can be expensive to implement, but, uh, uh, but again, it's an investment. And I know that, that uh, when, he, when he and I uh, were interviewed about it on the news here in Minnesota a few years ago. And one of the things that we had talked about is uh, just that the fact that so many people, again, it's what I alluded to earlier. It isn't just getting through the appointment. It's being able to look forward to the next one. Oh, yeah, I had a good experience last time. Nice. I'm going to be fine next time. And it would mm-hmm. have a huge impact by having the virtual reality items as well. But um, are you also familiar with uh, ASMR? Um, Vermont, just give me I a little more details. I, I couldn't tell you what the actual letters stand for, but I do know that collectively it's just it's ASMR. There are YouTube videos that are out there. And basically, it's kind of like, you know how if someone whispers in a baby's ear, they're more apt to kind of be still and then listen, or even yeah. or even in a, an adult, someone could whisper in your ear and, and it might tingle kind of a little bit. ASMR, it's the same idea. So oftentimes, it's, if it's somebody's whispering, um, people will sometimes read a book, but they'll talk like this. And if you get a, a slower tempo, it's almost kind of hypnotic. <laughs> yeah, but that's soothing tone. Yeah, and there are some advertisements now being used for that as well. I know during the Super Bowl, uh, I, there was a beer company that had used it a few years ago and just kind of helped soothe people and get their attention at the same time. Yeah, but, we we try and off, or encourage our staff to do that in a situation where things are escalated. We try and implement the technique called one voice a lot. Um, but sometimes <laughs> one voice does not work. So one voice is whenever you choose one adult in the room to be the speaker and everyone that has something to say would go through this person, this one person who's going to talk. So you can imagine with eight and you know, there's lots of videos out there about this. But if there's eight people talking at the same time, everyone's getting a little louder, a little louder, a little louder. Most people are saying it's OK. You're OK. You're going to be fine. It's OK. It's fine. OK. And, that, you know, you're you can feel the anxiety just in that. 10 seconds of me saying it, um, we will encourage a staff member or a parent, or we will do it, but we will get down into a patient's ear and whisper. And all of a sudden, they are so focused on what what is going on and who, what are you saying, that they mentally block out all the drama and stress going on around them. Um, and it can kind of also serve as a reminder to everyone else to kind of bring it down a notch and let's refocus what it is we're trying to accomplish. But we use the whispering a lot to be like, okay, just listen to me focus on me <laughs> yes yes and it, it it works it's just it's just crazy you know it's just I mean so so what these things that you've talked about whether it's about the machines themselves and how they're being perceived now by people or even just techniques mm-hmm. that you mentioned as well how long has this stuff been around like did, did these ideas kind of come into play like in the early 2000s or is it more recent than that or uh, I never Honestly, heard of them prior to It's kind of wild, but they've been around for an extremely long time. Um, It's just finally getting out there a little bit more. So they, we have had child life specialists at our hospital uh, since the, I mean, I feel like I need to fact check myself here, but for um, the eighties, I mean, maybe before that, it's really been, I was in grad school in 2013 um, and I learned all of this in textbooks that had been written in the 60s, I mean, a long time ago. So there, these techniques and this 
position, this job has been around for a really long time, but it's still so I I didn't know about it until I heard about it when I was in college. You know, most people, unless their child is seen at a children's hospital regularly, they don't know about it. Um, people just don't know. And yeah. and that's that, that's part of why I wanted to do the podcast today so that people could go ahead and not only watch the episode, but also forward it and, and try to get yeah. other people to watch it as well. Because so th- a lot of these things are are free. You know, the whole idea of pretend it's a tanning booth, pretend that you're on a, right. on a ride at a theme park as opposed to uh, being in a hospital, put a white noise app on your phone and listen to waves or, or whatever, whatever the scenarios are. Things are uh, can be low cost. Now, obviously, as we alluded to earlier, there are certain costs for the hospital that uh, where it's more of an investment up front, but there are ways that uh, that can kind of pay for itself later uh, as far as the things we mentioned about staff turnover and lower sedation rates and things like that. But um, yeah. is there is there anything today that I haven't either uh, called out or asked about or thing that things you wanted to highlight that uh, we haven't touched on? Um, I don't know. I would really just encourage people, especially if you're someone who has a child in your life, um, to reach out to whatever local children's hospital you have. Um, doctor's offices have often heard of them and can point you in the right direction. Dental offices sometimes have child life specialists. But if you try and connect with a child life specialist, we have so many resources at our fingertips. Um, and it just is, you, you don't know, you said this earlier, but you just don't know what you don't know and yeah. you don't know who you don't know. So if, yeah. if you can connect to somebody, we can, um, really change. And that the goal in my head is I will, in my the my coworkers, we will all reach so many kids and have so many positive experiences that when they grow up and they have a friend who has to get an MRI, they no longer are saying it's like you were buried alive. Exactly. They're going to start saying, <laughs> you know what? It actually is kind of relaxing. Like they they had stuff on the walls that really you know relaxed me when I walked in, and there was a movie playing, and I got to pick my music, and they put pillows under my knees and gave me a. a I had an MRI recently. I slept through the whole thing. Uh, they gave me a nice pillow like it was because it was on a foot. Um, but they we are going to create so many positive experiences that there is going to be way less of this negative talk around healthcare experiences. And this the needle phobia is going to just maybe someday totally disappear. Um, so there's just Which so is- much that can be done. And like you said, there's so much that can be done at a low cost. It's just knowledge and my right. my daughter right now is learning how to share wisdom she's four <laughs> and so that's just about the sharing of this wisdom um and helping that's people awesome. like, <laughs> yeah, it's that's kind of a awesome. funny concept for a four-year-old but she right. is <laughs> well, see, well and now now you can tell her that when it's thundering outside that it's you know the yes. angels are bowling for a birthday party yeah, yeah but Absolutely. but uh she would love now, to clap for that she you know anytime we can celebrate something that's that's a big deal that's cool. That's really cool. But uh, and just um, I, I kind of want to close things out as far as uh, also acknowledging that over the last few years, since the since the the pandemic started and the height of it and what have you, just being a caregiver in the in the healthcare industry. I mean, that in and of itself, I just want to stand here and just clap like for hours <laughs> because because uh, um, unfortunately, people are more apt to speak up only if something goes wrong and aren't as apt to speak up mm-hmm. when things go right. And so uh, I, I can tell you that as someone who's had radiation herself and someone who uh, appreciates whether it's music or uh, the other things that we talked about today, this is this is good. Yeah, this this is this is really appreciated, even if you don't always get feedback per se. But um, this is this is fantastic. So so thank you to you and your colleagues for doing what you do. Please pass along to uh, people at the hospital just how much uh, what you're doing is is appreciated. And um, I appreciate you being on the podcast today so that people can kind of educate themselves and educate others as well. You know, absolutely. Well, I appreciate you doing this podcast. I think that you know you can reach a lot of people with a lot of good information and really make a big difference. Well, with that being said, thank you very kindly. And thanks for being here, Erica. And for those of you who are listening, thank you for joining us today. Um, As I mentioned earlier, this podcast will be on my YouTube site and the channel is Emotional Grit. So feel free to like and subscribe for this and future episodes as well. So thanks, everyone. All right. Thank you.